Diane Shuchuk, a curator at the Albany Institute of History and Art, and today I'm going to show you some of the treasures that we store in our fabulous storage facility up here at 125 Washington Avenue. The Albany Institute of History and Art has been collecting for um, centuries, actually, but our Tulip Queen memorabilia related to the festival and the queen itself is very special to us and to Albany history. So I'm going to show you today some of the crowns associated with the Tulip Queen, also show you photographs from our library collection of Tulip Queen um, images of the Tulip Queen and things that she did while she was uh, during the year of service. I will show you some things related to the street sweepers. And I will tell you that not only is the Albany Institute's collection just about the Tulip Queen, but we also have the ability to look in other collections in our library related to, that I can find Tulip Queen memorabilia like the City Club of Albany's collection that we own here. Also the Morris Gerber photography collection that also has photographs from the different eras of the Tulip Queen. Uh, we own five scrapbooks related to the Tulip Queen from the 1950s to 1961, and I'll share one of those with you because I learn something new every day in my job, and I think I'm going to teach you some new things today as well that I didn't know about the Tulip Queen. So first I'm going to show you one of the earliest items we have in our collection associated with the Tulip Queen, and it's actually this 1949 designed Tulip Queen crown. The crown was designed by Hajo Kristoff, who had come to this country from Germany. He was a member of the Albany Artist group and at that time the Albany Artist Group in 1949 decided to hold a carnival gala kind of ball around the Tulip Festival. So um, Hey Joe Kristoff was a member of the Albany Artist Group and he was commissioned or a volunteer and I'm not sure to create a crown for the festival. So we own the original designs for the Tulip crowns and at that time in 1949 for the first two years they also presented a king and queen at the festival. So they nominated a king and queen. This is the queen's crown. This is the king's crown. It was described specifically in newspapers, so that's how we know this is the king's crown. So the king's crown, uh, they only had a king for two years because it said that the men, newspapers said that the men, there weren't enough men around because they had to go into the service at the time. So two years there was a king and then it just became a tulip queen solo doing all the duties she needed to do. The original crown did not have this uh, uh, rabbit fur and ermine lining. It was designed again in 1949, and a couple years later, as you can see from the drawing, this band was added. And George Right Hand, who was uh, a metalsmith in Albany who came to this country from Russia, he was actually hired to make the crown originally in 1949 and then to change it up a little bit in, 19, in a few years later. But by 1959, in 10 years, they decided that this crown weighed about three pounds and it was just far too heavy. It gave the Tulip Queen headaches. It interfered with her poise and glamour because can you imagine wearing this three pound item on your head while you're walking downstairs or doing all the duties associated with the queen? So at that point, they hired someone else, a local jeweler, to create a different crown out of sterling silver that was much lighter in weight. And this crown has, um, seen a lot of wear and tear, so it's not in the best condition, but it's still an important relic for us to have here at the museum. It's got these fake jewels in it, it's made of silver. At the time, it was described as having orange enamel to represent the orange wonder tulip associated with the one that, that was given to Albany by Queen Wilhelmina. So again, that enamel work has since gone from this crown, and we know that this plastic tulip is a replacement. So those are the two crowns in our collection. But what's a queen without a scepter? So we actually own in this collection the Tulip Queen scepter in this um, original box that it was probably kept in from year to year. And this box, uh, you can see it says Tulip Queen, right? It looks very homemade, but everybody's very proud of this. This is from the 50s again. And when you open it up, it has a little custom cutout place for the Tulip scepter. So the scepter, again, is a representation of that orange wonder tulip. It's a little bit of... Um, orange and uh, red, but now it's a little more yellow. It probably had a little glitter on it. So this was carried by the Tulip Queen at, during official engagements. There are many photographs of the Queen carrying the scepter. This is very lightweight. It's sort of like a magic wand. It's kind of fun. But if you want to see this in person, just give me a call. Uh, I don't know if the Tulip Queen has a scepter now, but this is just a nice... You can tell it's, it was lovingly cared for. It's been rewired. It's been um, refurbished from year to year. It's got this green tape around it, so it's not, but it's meant to be seen from a distance. But this would be, she would take this to hospital visits, and I'll show you some photographs of what the Tulip Queen did during her reign back in the 1950s. 
So at some point during the first few years of the Tool of the Queen's existence, it was decided to create an emblem of her office. And they went to a local jeweler named H.W. Antiman and asked the jeweler to design a pendant, or they called it a lavalier back then in the 1950s, that would be presented to the queen as a gift. And then she would wear this at official occasions. So that it was described as being gold, a three-dimensional gold tulip, which you see in this photograph, and with amethysts around it, also with citrine quartzes and pastel colors. We see this pendant being worn by many of the tulip queens of this period, yet we don't have one in our collection. So I would love to find one to add to our collection. If there is a tulip queen listening or out there and she has one of these and would love to donate it to us, we would love to have it. Often worn on a velvet ribbon around her neck. There are variations that were created after the first initial design, but for the first few years, Mayor Corning's job was to present this uh, to the queen. The queen got many, many gifts. I've even read in some of the scrapbooks I'm going to show you that Max Factor would give the queen as, uh, cosmetics. Stewart's ice cream would give the queen for three months and her court a, a half gallon of Stewart's flavor of the month. And uh, other things would be, a, uh, the local decorators and wallpapers association would underwrite the redesign or re you know, um, a new interior design for the queen's bedroom at home. She would also get a trip with her mother, always accompanied by her mother, to a city. It could, it could have been New York or Boston or sometimes Atlantic City. So the queen came away with many, many gifts back in the 50s with a complete wardrobe given by many of the huge department stores downtown in Albany, far more than today. There are many department stores contributing to the queen's sort of um, her goodie bags, really, the great goodie bags that the court was given were some major, major gifts at the time for the queen. So among the photographs we have in our collection is this really great 1956 photograph of members of the City Club of Albany doing their street sweeping duties right before the Tulip Festival. Among the City Club's archive that we hold here are numerous files filled with information about the City Club's movement to tidy up for tulip time, which was one of the slogans from the 1950s. Tidy up for tulip time meant really cleaning up your streets of Albany, going ward by ward and making sure things were picked up just in time for Tulip Festival. But one of the great things about this is we actually can see the costumes these women are wearing. And we have those costumes in our collection, some of them. The City Club donated a number of things to us that we're happy to have. And I'm gonna show you how incredibly colorful they are. And they're meant to represent Dutch housewives. So the first thing I'm gonna show you, because I can't resist showing you this, because it's got a little bit of the sound, is this amazing cap that was meant to be like a Dutch housewife with these wire, it's like a doily, actually, honestly, a doily stuck on your head. If you wanna see this in person, it one for yourself just give me a call or email me and we can try to figure out how to make one it's got these little charming bells at the top and on the bottom can you hear it little tingle so you can imagine a group of women wearing this while they're scrubbing the streets of state street as kind of a ceremonial thing at the start of the tulip festival these costumes are really well made they're mostly cotton they're incredibly colorful and what i like about some of them is they're meant to fit one size fits all because they could be borrowed from the city club this is a bib worn over a blouse and we store these in acid-free boxes separated by acid-free tissue. So this is the skirt, this is an apron. You can see how colorful it is and what good condition it's in. And they're incredibly colorful. And then this is an amazing stripe. This will look great on an exhibition someday when we do an exhibition about this, because who could resist this striped, amazing striped skirt that went underneath that apron and then you'd wear a blouse with a bib, okay? So what, if we got it on a mannequin, we steam it out and make it look really great. But one of the, my favorite things is how adjustable this is with the six different buttonholes and buttons. So it would fit anybody in the, collect, in the city club that wanted to borrow this. So again, we just have layers upon layers. And they're just, they use the most amazing, colorful things. And this is a blouse that went with that same collection, that same outfit, actually, the same costume all made probably locally by women. There were patterns in the Albany newspapers about how to make your own Dutch hat if you want to make a hat. Because there were also many parades during the Tulip Festival with people riding on floats that needed to wear these Dutch costumes. Again, a nod to Albany's amazing Dutch heritage. So here's the second one in the box. This is a little simpler, but it's got some nice hand embroidery on it. And it's just a simple black apron. And the farther down in the box we go, and I haven't looked at these in a long time, so it's also always a treat for me when someone wants to see something from our collection because we don't get to open every box every day. We're so busy doing some, 
um, lots and lots of exhibitions. So again, here's another skirt, but this bib is slightly different. This is a little pleated number. You'd probably just pin to your uh, the front of your dress, and it still says City Club on it, which I like. And this is the, the these are the decades of rickrack. I always liked rickrack as a kid. I think you can still buy it at Joanne's Fabrics, but here's a lot of rickrack on this pleated cotton little bib. So I can go on. Oh, and here's a different version of the cap, but it still has wire. It just is missing the bells. So again, this is one of these Dutch caps that were made for the City Club to wear during the streets scrubbing. Among the many photographs we own in our library collection, in the Morris Gerber collection in particular, are these photographs that were taken probably for publicity purposes in the Knickerbocker News or the Times Union. I picked, out of all the photographs, I picked two to show you today that I really liked. This is Tulip Queen, this one right here is Tulip Queen Carol Thorson in 1957. And she's actually just debarking, coming off of a submarine that she was touring. I don't know the name of the submarine that was here in 1957, but here she is being escorted down the gangway with a number of officers, probably from the submarine. I love that she's trying to juggle all her crown, her scepter, her cape, and her high heels as she walks down this gangway. And you can see a little bit of her lacy petticoat right underneath her skirt. But I, and she's also been presented with a bouquet of flowers, as was customary when the Tulip Queen appeared somewhere. This other photograph also speaks to what the Tulip Queen's duties were during the year she was in office, basically. And this is a 1956 photograph uh, at Albany Hospital of Tulip Queen Nadia Spiak. And she's greeting, and she has members of her court with her. Oftentimes the court traveled with the Tulip Queen in their official capacity as ambassadors for the city. And here she is greeting a young girl in a wheelchair at Albany Hospital again. And she is letting the child hold her scepter. And the scepter is the exact one I showed you today. It's the one in our collection. It's the same crown. It's the 1955 version of the crown. And she's wearing probably a royal scarlet red velvet cape with probably a rabbit fur collar, which is also one of the ones we have in our collection. The capes didn't change much in style, so it's hard to date those. You have to try to match them up with the photograph. But these are two of the photos just showing you what the Tulip Queen's responsibilities it was she had and the fact that she had to wear all this regalia all the time when she was performing these duties and balancing this crown and taking along everything else. So our collection includes five mammoth, incredibly heavy, you can see me try to pick this up right now, scrapbooks related to the Tulip Queen Festival starting in 1951. We don't, we don't know when they started creating these scrapbooks, but we only have five, and they end in 1961. These are just a treasure trove of information. And I'm going to show you a few pages from the ephemera, from the tickets to the royal balls, from the programs for the festival, from newspaper clippings about the selection of the Tulip Queen. And this one is from 1953. So let's find you a fun page to look at. So here is, there was always a festival ball, as you know, at the armory back then. There were also very impressive tulip flower festival here at the Albany Institute, which we hosted, a juried competition of designs, including incorporating tulips. So this is a Tulip Queen dinner. Here is a Tulip Festival ball at the State Armory. And I bet you didn't know that there was a Tulip Queen song called When Tulips Bloom Again. So you could call me up if you want me to scan this or just take a photograph of it. And you can sing the Tulip Queen, uh, tu When Tulips Bloom Again, which was written by Betty Crummy. No, music was by Betty Crummy and words were by Jean Steffens. So if no one knows about the Tulip Queen song, here it is from 1953. It also tells you what the judges were looking for. It talks about the judges looking for a wholesome um, young woman who was between the ages of 16 and 25, what other characteristics they were looking for. It talks about um, everything from what the Dutch Settler Society did. Again, it was a week-long festival. It talks about the planting of the bulbs in Washington Park. It talks about the Tulip Festival, and here it starts talking about the entrance for the Tulip Queen. There's always photographs of the different Tulip Queen entrance then there are oftentimes interviews with the Tulip Queens after she, is, um, after she becomes Tulip Queen, she's often interviewed and she often, they ask her things like, what do you wanna do? And they ask her what her favorite foods are. One queen in particular said her favorite food was spumoni, which I found amusing and she wanted to have four children. Um, it asks where they've gone to school. So a lot of them went to Mildred Ellie Business School. But the ultimate goal for many of these women, as one of the judges said, was to become um, a housewife. So that was, this is again the 1950s. But this is again how we can find the pendant. There's, there's a description about the pendant I talked about. There's a description about, there was a tulip fe film in Italy because there's an Albany woman that um, created a film about the tulip festival that was shown abroad. 
There is these, you can get so much information from these amazing scrapbooks, but please, if you're scrapbooking yourself, do not use scotch tape. Use some archival material so things don't fall off the pages. Use, a, use the right glue or call us and we'll help you put together a scrapbook. But again, oh, the other great thing about the Tulip Queen was that she was always presented with a special gown, oftentimes designed in New York City, and it was the, one of the newspapers that funded that gown. So they were, and the gowns were modeled before she actually wore this gown to the Tulip Ball. And you can see the fabulous Buffon 1950s, a couple of Christian Dior dresses that would come to Albany from New York City, sponsored again by the local newspaper. And often her court was given matching identical dresses featuring a Tulip print. I'm gonna see if I can find one of those for you because each page, and, and they were, these scrapbooks also are great for fashion because you would need a new dress to wear to the Tulip Ball, so oftentimes the stores hosted fashion shows for women, and they would dress models up and then print these photographs in the newspapers of what kind of fashions, because there was a debate in the 50s whether your dress should be cocktail length or to the floor. And you'll see these photographs in these scrapbooks. And again, these are all available to you to come to us. If you make an appointment, you can come to the, our library. I would bring one of these out for you. And you can page through it yourself and learn some amazing facts about not only Tulip Festival history, but about Albany history and what life was like in the 50s. The different windmills that were created for, for the floats. Oh, and the fact that Albany had a kinder kermess, which was a children's festival at the same time. And they themselves, um, they anointed a princess and prince of the kinder of the children's festival that would sometimes be a bleaker park or sometimes a, in Washington Park and you can you'll find out the, um, what that festival entailed by reading these scrapbooks and every and this really everybody in Albany was involved from the businesses to the local people to the uh, civic organizations to the nonprofits again there's another photograph a newspaper clipping of a the city club of Albany sweeping the streets wearing a costume very similar to the ones I showed you today. So this is something, oh, and sometimes the dresses is this one. They were shaped like tulip petals because everything again was about the tulip, the tulip song, the tulip. Um, and Ma Mrs. Corning would often send bouquets of tulips on Mohawk Airlines to other mayor's wives in New York State. And that's documented in here. And Mohawk Airlines, some of you may remember Mohawk Airlines. I don't, but it's um, definitely an airline that came out of Albany. And what I'm gonna end with something that I found fascinating. Here's a menu for the Tulip Queen dinner held at the DeWitt Clinton Crystal Dining Room in 1953. And one of the things that I noticed the most, I love reading menus. I think everybody relates to food. You're all gonna be eating dinner tonight or another day. Listing the different foods, it ends, one of the dessert choices was a tulip parfait. This was a dinner given on Saturday, May 16th, again in 1953, but it mentions a tulip cocktail. And I didn't know anything about a tulip cocktail. It was. Uh, 60 cents to have an order a tulip cocktail at the DeWitt Clinton Crystal Dining Room. And the cocktail was, it simply says, Dubonnet and gin with a twist of lemon peel. It doesn't have the proportions, but I leave that up to you to try and to make one yourself and let us know how it tastes. So again, Dubonnet and gin with a twist of lemon peel was the official tulip cocktail served in 1953. Perhaps we should start a tradition again. Among our collection, uh, people love shoes. Everybody loves shoes. Who doesn't love a good shoe? But nestled in these drawers are shoes from the 18th century to almost the present day. And one of the remarkable things is, in this very deep drawer, because these are deep, are a collection of wooden shoes that were often that were worn by some of the street sweepers. So this is a pair donated to us by the City Club again. And you can tell they were very well worn. Clearly, I've never tried walking in a pair of wooden shoes. I can't imagine how uncomfortable this is. But this is a very well-worn pair. It even says Holland on them, so these are probably imported. Oh, with a traditional windmill on them, painted. So this is a, a lovely pair of wooden shoes that would have been worn along with the costumes that I showed you too, with that elaborate skirt, the multicolored striped skirt. So the you can see the colors all go together, really. And we have another pair of wooden shoes. Well, we have many. These are like bigger. I don't know the history of these. But this is a, maybe a man's pair of wooden shoes because there are a lot of photographs in the scrapbooks of men wearing these, quote, Dutch boy costumes or what they interpreted as Dutch peasant costumes. And they would have worn these as well, escorting the women to State Street. These are pretty heavy. I couldn't imagine clunking around State Street and on cobblestones or anything with these. But here they are, safely put away in the drawers here. So that 50 years from now and 100 years from now, people will know what was so important about the Tulip Festival. Thank you.